session of the day. And I think the reason I'm being asked is uh, because uh, of a strict cherry. Uh, that's why I said, right? But uh, we, we're supposed to now uh, have a discussion on uh, uh, energy planning. And uh, those uh, comrades uh, uh, who are from South Africa will know that uh, uh, last week uh, the minister released what is called an integrated resource plan, a IRP. And this is uh, about uh, 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 planning in the energy sector. And we have uh, uh, Richard Worthington to speak to us about uh, planning uh, in South Africa in relation to energy and uh, what that uh, involves. Secondly, he will also uh, speak about some, some of the recent policy uh, developments. He's promised to speak uh, for about 20 minutes so that we can have uh, time to have a discussion uh, before we close exactly at five, five o'clock. So over to you, Richard. Good afternoon, comrades. Thanks for the opportunity. So um, this is not about the ideal way of doing energy planning for a low carbon economy. That wasn't my brief. It was just to talk about where we are with it at the moment in South Africa. So this is not how it should be. But just to say that what we have in policy for 1998 is, is provisions for integrated energy planning, which would look at the entire energy system and take an integrated view on all of the impacts, the opportunities, etc. We have that in theory and in practice, but and, and that would start from a departure point of looking at energy service needs. What are the energy services that our society needs, households, business, industry, etc. And then what is the best way to supply it? We also have the National Development Plan, particularly Chapter 5, is pertinent to energy planning, although what we have in Chapter 5 is not entirely a coherent plan. In fact, before it was edited, the 2011 version was more coherent, and some of that coherence managed to be taken out with regard to um, looking at, at the carbon um, profile, at least. Um, and then the idea is also that there's some level of integration with industrial development strategy, but that's something we haven't been seeing coming to fruition yet. So what we actually have is a bunch of supply side strategies, including a gas utilization master plan as yet unpublished, but in progress for many, many years. And it's there, people have seen it, it just hasn't been properly promulgated. There's a liquid fuels investment strategy, that includes the whole question of should Petrosa be allowed to build a new refinery? So that also hasn't been published. Um, there is a coal roadmap, which was published back in 2013, which would like to see the, co the, the coal industry grow strongly. There's um, a new one, a strategy came out in 2018 from the then Chamber of Mines in a similar vein. And then in electricity, we get an integrated resource plan for electricity. Actually, it's for supply into the grid. It doesn't deal with off-grid supply, although it's starting to talk about that a little bit. But for the most part, it's how do we get electricity into the grid? And when it comes to universal access to electricity services, <coughs> the integrated resource plan is silent. There is a separate household energy strategy, which I don't think we'll have time for today. But I would take issue with saying that the, the REIPPPP was where privatization started coming into electricity, because when they did the solar home systems back in 2002, three, they contracted that out to the private sector too. <laughs> Um, so there was this idea to have solar home systems, but it all had to work as a partnership with the private sector, and the whole program was was rather a mess. It certainly gave solar home systems a bad name because they were small, and it, it promulgated a model which meant that people still had to pay even for services that they saw as inadequate. And you could argue that that was because government chose to partner with the private sector and, and basically put it out to concessions. Um, and what we also have, and what continues to be heard all over the place, is a, a form of resource determinism. When people say, we've got this endowment, we've got to use it. Someone stood up in the National Planning Commission workshop the other day and said, but what will we do with the coal? Like, leaving it there underneath our farmlands would be such a terrible thing to do with it. Because there is clean coal, 
it's the coal that's underneath all of our farmland. So as long as it stays underneath the farmland, it'll stay clean coal. It's when you dig it up that you start getting dirt. But anyway, monetization of mineral, of mineral resources has been part of our industrial and, and development strategy for ages. We haven't come up, overcome that yet. So I was actually asked to deal mostly with the integrated resource plan that has just come out. This is a picture of our entire energy system and the demand for energy is here. <coughs> Chemical, heat energy, more than 50% of our energy services, are our energy is used in the form of heat. Mechanical, including cars and machines, so lots of petrol and diesel going into transport, etc. And some lighting. But all the IRP deals with is this one up here. So they look at demand for electricity, they do look at where it is going a little bit. And then they look at where do we get it from, which at the moment is mostly common. So that's that's what we do. We don't look at the whole system and figure out how best to adjust it. We deal with pieces, and that's what we are doing. So um, I'm not going to go into this in any great detail, but one of the things that, that civil society was calling for already years ago is that we start planning for success rather than how to muddle through perpetuating the system we have. So then how do we define success? We can define it in terms of energy conservation, efficient use, system management, demand side management, of success in developing local manufacturing for renewable energy technologies. We got, for years back from when we started the strategy in 2003, we were saying we should have a strategy to build local manufacturing, to build an industry, not just to get a little bit of renewables into the system, but actually to create industries. So one can conceptualize planning in terms of planning for success of doing that kind of thing. Success in developing smart grid and user interfacing, rather than just saying, we'll, we'll put in smart grids that work for us because we want to be able to control what you do. So the user interfacing is, a, is an important one there. Success in achieving universal access to modern energy. It hasn't been coming up in IRP. As I said, there's a separate strategy for that, but it's very outdated. That could also look at some of the traditional biomass that is still used that is responsible for a lot of indoor air pollution. And then success in a just transition. What we have in, by way of a, a carbon plan at the moment, a, 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 a international commitment, I'm not going to go into just for time constraints, I'll just give you a picture of an international assessment of it. Our policy is this band here. And what we've committed to do internationally is this band here, the so-called National Determined Contribution. It's judged internationally by Climate Tracker and others as utterly inadequate, and the blue line added there is the sort of thing we should be looking at, as Africa Climate Reality Project have suggested in their online position paper. I'd encourage you to look at it, but our purpose isn't to look at that now. But one part of energy planning really does need to be carbon budgeting. And it's something that was adopted under the National Development Plan, but without a lot of clarification of exactly what it should be. So what I've put down here is some of the things that civil society have been saying for some time about carbon budgeting, and I'm just going to go to the headline points. There are other details there if you want to look at the presentation later. It involves looking at the entire system, not just looking at what is the carbon profile of this technology, that technology, that technology, and is this one a bit better than that? Well, okay, good enough, incremental improvement. No. So let's look at the whole system and see what our carbon footprint is going to be going forward and how we plan to bring that down. It focuses on development objectives. So the, the focus shouldn't really, for carbon budgeting, be exactly how much you get per technology. It should be what social services, what public benefits are associated with what emissions. Where could we squeeze emissions without <coughs> detrimental public impact? And where would it have a detrimental public impact? So if you're looking, for example, at coal-fired um, power these days, and you've got a cheaper and cleaner alternative, then there's no developmental reason to be giving coal budget, uh, a carbon budget to coal. And it seeks to discover an optimum allocation of emissions allowances. So I had to put something in about what we could hope to see. Um, and we need to not forget about carb, uh, methane. So we talk about carbon budget, people think of carbon dioxide, which is the main greenhouse gas, but methane is also very significant. And if there's leakage above about 2.8% from the entire gas supply chain, it's no less of a greenhouse problem than coal. So gas being better than coal from a greenhouse perspective is dependent on having very, very tight supply chains because you get leakage from, the, from, from where the gas is extracted, you get leakage along the transport, along the pipelines, and then when it goes into 
mean, you can smell it, but you've got a little bit of methane leakage into gas heater because they put a smell in there. So gas potentially is no better than coal from a climate perspective. From an indoor air pollution, from particulates and other emissions, it is cleaner, but we shouldn't forget about methane. So what have we got in the IRP 2018? This is what I consider to be some salient features. There's a lot of, of modeling behind it. I'm not going to look at the modeling. There's some nice work being done there. But the plan is actually a plan to 2030. It talks about 2050, and previously when we were looking at updates, we were looking at having a plan longer term. They've said, actually, too much uncertainty about the long term. So this plan runs to 2030. They've run the models to 2050. So the modeling results that you'll find in the appendices to the document, well worth having a look at, they run to 2050. But the part that is considered to be the plan is that up to 2030. And it provides official recognition of a decisive shift in technology costs of renewable energy, which is now the cheapest new plant. And it recognizes that big coal and nuclear no, really, no longer really make sense, although it's careful not to totally close the door on them. And it has stuff talking about how we should still be looking at clean coal technologies if we can find such a <laughs> thing. Um, it ignores the opportunity of cost negative emissions reduction. It says nothing about the fact that previously, when we did a plan like this and it was officially published, in other words, eight years ago, the situation was that mitigation in electricity supply was an additional cost. Because of the major shift in renewable energy performance in South Africa, at any rate, um, it, is no, it is now a cost negative opportunity, and yet that's ignored. It assumes that the ESCOM fleet performance is substantially improved. It, it assumes that it will get up to 80% of the entire fleet fully available within a couple of years and then stays at just over 80%. Um, it fudges the issue of compliance with air quality standards. It just says we sort of assume that they'll comply with them, even though ESCOM have said that they can't afford to do so. And it ignores coal supply challenges such as ESCOM under, well, not investing in the tide mine at Arnhem. So ESCOM was getting on a power station. It was on the, on the coal field. It was getting a direct conveyor belt from the mine head. They stopped investing in Arnett. They're now trucking the coal in from a long distance away. That makes it quite a difference to the, the cost proposition for running that power plant. That whole issue of what's been going on, the Haramadaikis in the coal supply industry, just doesn't talk about it. It does endorse increasing provision for independent power producers, including from fossil fuel generation. Both coal and gas are mentioned in this regard. It creates a value of death for the development of local renewable energy manufacturing. I'll explain that. It still imposes arbitrary constraints on the deployment of wind and solar. The minister came out and said, we've addressed civil society's concerns about putting constraints on wind and solar by running a scenario that doesn't have those constraints. Jeff, the last IRP ran a scenario without those constraints. It didn't, solve, it didn't address our complaints then, and it sure ain't going to do just by doing the same thing again. So there's this real reluctance to get to grips with the issue of what are the constraints of massively increasing the share of renewable energy. It just says, oh, we don't think we can do more than this, so we'll put in a constraint. But it doesn't justify the 1,000 or 1,600 figure that is, is, that is constrained per annum. And then it's silent on access to electricity <laughs> for 3 million households, as have been identified by the Department of Energy as meaning electricity. So the retirement schedule for ESCOM, exactly the same as it was in the IRP 2010. There has been no change to this retirement plan and the purported plans for introducing emissions control equipment hasn't been updated, even though ESCOM is applying for another postponement. When I said it creates a value of death for renewable energy, I was referring to this. So this is the build plan, the, the policy adjustment plan, as they call it. So for each year, across the top 2018, what is in place? This is what they pretend that they intend renewables to do. The yellow is already committed under the IPP program. So they're saying we'll stick to what's already committed. And then sometime in the future, we'll start building again. But for those years, nothing. Now, if you're trying to build industries in renewable energy technologies in South Africa, and someone says, well, you're going to have to go through a plant which we just don't procure anyway, that is a value of death for building local industries. Those numbers are megawatts, family. Uh, yes, those are megawatts. So the 2018 is, is what's already in place. Yep. You'll see the whole table just now. And then the yellow is what's going to be built 
as per plans and the green is what's going to be by existing plans and then the green additional endorsed in this plan. So there's there's less new capacity all round because the demand projections are considerably down from where they were because our demand has actually been flat. You could argue that demand projections in here are still too ambitious, but I won't go there. So that's one of the things. Um, so to give you a bit of a sense, and this is the only slide with a few scenarios because we don't spend a long time on this, we've got 2020 and then 2030, five different scenarios that they're reporting to us on. The point of this slide is to say, well, if you look at these different scenarios, they don't look all that different, do they? This is 2030. They model through to 2040 and to 2050, and they show those results too. Things have got better in that they're showing us the CO2, the water usage, and the unit cost all in the integrated table. So the way you're presenting information has definitely improved somewhat. Um, and they're also talking about the percentage of supply in terms of actual electricity rather than just in installed capacity, which can be quite, now, before they, they just looked at the number of megawatts, which doesn't actually necessarily correspond to the amount of electricity that comes out of a plant. And what they're saying is overall the installed capacity and energy mix for scenarios tested for the period post 2030 differ significantly for all scenarios. Why are they telling us this? This is a plan to 2030. And yet they're anxious to point out that post-2030, things are really going to change. It's kind of a way of telling us that up to 2030, we don't see a lot very much change. Um, and you can see from the outputs along the bottom, the range of CO2 emissions outcomes in 2030 between 207 and 217. It's not a lot of difference between the so-called low carbon scenario and other scenarios. Um, so the full new build plan is this table here. So here we've got coal, and those two green ones, the, the yellow up in the coal is Madupi and Casino. Those two green ones, that's the coal IPPs, um, Tabametsi and Kandisa. Kandisa. Um, I've added those hundreds in there to suggest that maybe they should think about doing some storage. And what we're not clear with the gas, this is, it says gas or diesel, but it doesn't indicate whether these are peaking plants, which is what gas is best for providing responsive plants that can fill in the gaps or whether that is combined cycle mid marriage mm -hmm. plant which from the volumes that they're putting in appears to be and from the text in the document itself they're very clearly contemplating that including at least some ipp mid merit gas which is questionable and then that final column they call it embedded generation um, other people would prefer that it just said distributed generation because, you know, does it have to be embedded in the grid or could it be in mini grids or whatever? Well, they're not looking beyond the grid, so they're calling it embedded and they're saying we know that stuff is happening out there that we haven't got a grip on. So we're putting in the plan that there's going to be about 200 megawatts a year because the private sector is installing that kind of amount at the moment anyway, and we don't seem to be able to stop. It. So it's it's provided for in the plan as a kind of way of acknowledging that there's an issue there without it actually being part of the plan because there's no plans for delivering it. <coughs> but it is kind of a way of signaling, I guess, to municipalities that it's expected that municipalities will accept embedded generation, which some of them already do. So that's the plan. Um, in terms of what we could do with the plan, some of us will be suggesting that the two IPPs from coal should be scrapped and that can go to renewables, that at least two units of casino be scrapped and that capacity be provided by renewables, and that the gas should only be peaking plant and if you're doing mid-merit, you can get that from renewables as well. Perhaps CSP, which for some reason, now South Africa used to boast that we were amongst the top five countries in doing concentrated solar power technology, CSP. It's the concentrated plants where you get all the heliostats concentrating the heat and then you have a steam generator, same as in a coal-fired power plant, and you can store the heat so you can dispatch. So, you know, CSP, South Africa was positioning itself as leading. ESCOM still has a CSP project in process. They said they wanted to be world leaders in CSP. Well, it seems like that idea has been dropped. Just a little bit of the stuff behind the plan itself. There is a socioeconomic impact assessment study. Now, those of you who followed Medlac will know that any major government plan has to be subject to 
one of these socioeconomic impact assessment studies by the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation. There is one, and it's interesting in places. I've just taken this bit up, what it says about labor unions, the behavior that must be changed, people, I hope you're noting, and I don't think they really mean it like that, it's just accidental work. The behavior that, they, that they're concerned with is protection of jobs in various sectors, manifests as resistance to energy transition. And it's not me saying it, that's government. That's how they perceive the position at the moment. So jobs in certain sectors may decline in the long term, but new opportunities for jobs are created in other sectors. Um, that's presumably not the behavior that needs to be changed. That's actually their solution. Um, but main mechanisms develop a transition path in consultation with labor with a focus to shift from job protection to job creation and skills training, engage with labor and their concerns, e.g. the men like Job Summit. I'm not sure if the Job Summit is offering to engage with all of the concerns, but so there is, a, a contingent within government that do think planning for a transition is a good idea. They don't call it a just transition here, um, but that hasn't been, I don't think, communicated to, to the constituency yet that, that this is what they intend to do as part of the ILP process. But you could, you could point out that their own document, since this is the, the impact assessment for the ILP, requires that there should be a focus, a, 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 a consultation, and um, in summarizing the impact, they put it differently. <coughs> Tensions between labor and government business of the old power power plants are retired. To deal with that in the long run, a clear transition plan. So they, they, they're calling for a clear transition plan. They've said it very quietly in an attached document, but we've got it somewhere. Um, their conclusion of the analysis from the scenarios, the significant change in the energy mix post-2030 indicates the sensitivity of the results observed to the assumptions made. A slight change in the assumptions can therefore change the path chosen. So it's a bit disingenuous here. Any long-term modeling, even a small change in assumption, if you model for 30 years, is going to be a substantial difference by the time that's played through for 30 years. <coughs> this is a new build plan to 2030. The observation regarding sensitivity to assumptions only manifests after 2030 in the model. You saw what those plans were looking like to 2030. Not much difference between each one. So it would actually be more relevant to observe that the assumptions chosen lead to very little change up to 2030. And so one has to ask oneself, is this really just a political compromise and an invasion that's masquerading as an integrated plan? The CO2 constraints that they use, they're utterly artificial and outdated, but the number of their proposed budget for electricity 2021 to 2050, so that's a four-year carbon budget for electricity supply in South Africa, they reckon that a tight budget would be 5,470 megatons. We currently do emit about 547, so Annual emissions from everything, of which 45% is, is electricity supply, is about one-tenth of that. They're saying for electricity going forward, that's what we need. If you look at how that corresponds to other projections of, of what our emissions could look like, for example, from this recently published book on South Africa's energy transition, this is a great piece of work. Um, it's a journalist as well as a technical guy from, used to be with the, the Council for Scientific, I'll, I'll send you the slides, Council for Scientific, um, CSIR, Council for Industrial. Scientific and Industrial Research. So, Bishop Nims, he was there, Kramer, Kramer's mining news, you know about engineering news. So these two got together and have written this book that provides a roadmap for a decarbonized, low-cost and job-rich future. It's not just about electricity. The book looks also at providing heat, providing mechanical energy, in other words, electrification of transport. So they're looking at electricity primarily, but not just at the energy, the energy services that are currently met by electricity, which is about a third of total energy services currently met with electricity. They're looking at all of energy services and how, if we utilize our renewables and electrify a lot of the other um, energy supply chains, it would give us a, well, a, a big economic advantage under, under a globalized um, 
economy. That's, that's the way they've chosen to message it, is to say we could have an industrial program here that makes us the Saudi America of chemicals derived from renewables, for example. I'd encourage you to have a read, but the point I'm, I'm showing you that is because this is an analysis from there. Um, the bar up there is our international um, emissions constraint that we've agreed to. The jiggly line there is the least cost electricity supply scenario that they've modeled in this book, which is similar to what they've um, presented via the IRP process. And then this is the carbon budget for electricity that we would be aspiring to if we were going according to what will keep us in line with the global goal. So we have the application of a carbon budget in our integrated resource plan that does something like this. For the period, I, the period to 2010 doesn't tell us much. So here I've looked at 2050 just to see how their full um, projection for electricity would play out. And so government is still asking for a pathway like this for electricity in terms of our emissions, which is above the least cost pathway and way above what is required um, by the Paris commitment to keep global warming well below two degrees. I think I should probably stop there. I did have a couple of slides on the fact that we're not being programmatic in our approach to off-grid supply. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to end with a, in fact, I'm not even going to end there. I'm just going to leave it blank. <laughs> Don't leave you staring at something. So this, so that's, that's trying to give you a taste of what's in the integrated resource plan and how it fits in a bit more with the overall planning, just to say that there's no prospect of getting an integrated energy plan out of government anytime soon. All of the formal interactions indicate that they've pretty much given up on the idea of putting out an integrated energy plan as such. There may be a document that's called that, but it's basically going to be a compendium of the gas utilization master plan, liquid fuels, um, possibly the coal roadmap, although that's very dated, and then this ILP. So rather than trying to look at all energy demand and then work back from that, the integrated plan is going to be not so much integrated as collected. Okay. Okay. Uh, comrades, uh, that was uh, uh, Richard. Um, his input on the planning and uh, maybe he didn't use that, the fragmented planning that takes place uh, in the energy sector in South Africa. Um, and the fact that we have a, a, an electricity plan that uh, presents itself as the energy plan when it's really, an, the IRP is an electricity plan, not an IEP as we were promised in the, in the past. So uh, let's uh, uh, open it uh, up for questions, uh, uh, comments. We have, uh, we have uh, 30 minutes. Uh, uh, so um, I note a uh, hand here in front, Dave. Uh, uh, okay, let's say, uh, comrades uh, from NUMSA, three. Let's, let's take those three. Okay. My question is really about um, how the I IRP deals with shale gas. And uh, is it a reality? Is it something the state projects as, as you know, happening in, in the future, or has it been sidelined? OK. Uh, no, 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 you take uh, one, two, three. That's, uh, that's uh, the best way to, to proceed. Go on. Okay, no, thank you very much, uh, Congress. Uh, just to highlight the, the first point regarding uh, the IRT that was uh, out on Monday last week. The uh, first point I want to highlight is that who's the author of the IRT? <coughs> Secondly, what type of a document that we have that is going to play in the future of the country which doesn't reference anything? Obviously, at this day and age, you must reference a document of that nature to see I've looked into this document, I've looked into this document, I've looked into this document. And also to have an input from experts. Because what we've seen from this, I will start first with the IRP of 2010. The forecasting there 
the assumptions behind the forecasting were totally wrong. That's why today, in the IRP now, the 2018 one, they are saying there were errors of 30% in terms of forecasting. So the anticipated growth of 2010 didn't materialize. That's why NUMSA early this year went to court to say, when you are planning to add capacity, when there is no growth, what are you actually doing? You understand? Because the IRP is based on demand in growth. You understand? So when you are saying now you are getting capacity, what are you actually doing? So when I look at the IRP when it was released last week, even the starting point of the growth is wrong. If you check 2016, they've got a straight line graph. But when you check the net sent out, it's flat and it's going down. So there is no growth. The economy is not growing. So that plan that is awaited there, I've got a, a problem with it, you understand? Because I don't think there's been a serious study to understand the economy. One of the points that are being made there, they are saying they are anticipating the mining will grow. Do they understand that the consumption of electricity in today is less than the consumption of electricity in 1989 when it comes to the mining sector? So it is interesting to see uh, whoever who's writing the document, is he taking this into consideration? Now I'm going to move further now according to the plan that is already there. They mentioned gas. We don't have gas in South Africa. Where are we going to take this gas? So now we are going to depend on other countries for the security of our supply. You understand? So the IRP, as I'm saying, uh, there was still a lot of uh, issues that were still falling with it from my side because the forecasting, I don't think it's right. And what we've seen that, Jeff, for example, there was a letter that was written by the previous ESCOM leadership that indicated that the demand is not growing. There is improvement in the energy availability effect. You understand? So in that context, let us not add. Now, the previous minister didn't agree to the signing of the agreement of both. Now, but what we've seen now in April, although that ESCOM has wrote that letter to say there is no good, what is the point of signing this agreement? The new government continued to sign. Bear in mind that the cabinet was appointed on the 26th of February. On the 8th of March, they already read with the paper to say we need to have this additional. Within a period of 10 days, what is it that they know? All right, all right. So, so all the right. ministerial on its own, we need to look. Similarly, there are people who've got other, you see, plans of what they want to do, you see, with ESCOM and also the energy sector is of All right. Thanks all right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, just two very quick ones. One of the things which you mentioned was that there is this underlying sort of assumption in the IRP that ESCOM will somehow uh, meet the air quality standards. Um, but having been to one of the public hearings last week, it's quite clear, and also in the background information document, that in many cases, I think the exact wording is, uh, we will never be compliant. A lot of plants, they're going to run until they decommission, and they're not actually going to try and add the latent technology because they see it's too expensive. So, Although that doesn't necessarily affect the energy mix, it affects the uh, climate change and environmental and human health aspects of the plan they might implement. So it's just something to consider. And a very quick one on the CSP, you showed in that table that got no concentrated solar power coming on. Um, I'm not sure, my suspicion, and one of the reasons is in the last hearings when the CSP you guys pointed out that their price is. Um, electricity and storage, but they're essentially just measured on the electricity. So it's kind of a bit of an unfair comparison. So that might be why if the new IRP that actually gone for an easy cost model, it's kicked out CSP because it includes storage and they're just looking at it as energy. I'm not sure, that's a suspicion. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Richard? No, yeah, 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 next round. Let's run. Let's, let's take okay. these three and then we'll. Um, yeah, there's Tenberger and Daniel. There's, you, you, yeah. So the, the author of the IRP is the Department of Energy. 
Um, I agree with you. You look at that document, like, where are your references? What the document, the way it's been put together, is is not inspiring. Um, there is a lot of, of research behind it, but they're not very good at reflecting that. But let me not make apologies for them. Um, the the document itself, I mean, it doesn't even have a decent language in it. Um, on the issue of gas, the IRP pretends to be agnostic on whether or not we will be doing shale gas. But in planning for 7,000 megawatts plus of gas installed capacity, they are clearly anticipating that we will do gas. And in some of the um, discussion, it does anticipate that there could be <coughs> shale gas. So you could say the IRP is agnostic on, on whether we'll do shale gas or not. But if you read between the lines, you could say that it's preparing the way for shale gas, um, even though there's not much prospect of it being available in time for the gas that's in plan for before 2030. So by implication, it also assumes that we will be importing some of that gas, probably in the form of liquid um, natural gas. So to transport natural gas over long distances, they freeze it and put it under intense um, pressure so that it turns into a liquid and then they tanker it around and then when you want to bring it on shore you've got to depressurize it again so you need a terminal to receive your liquefied natural gas convert it into gas that can go into pipelines um so yeah the, the there is clearly an endorsement of gas there is not a clear endorsement of fracking of the Karoo, but in the way they discuss gas and the prospects of it becoming a national resource, they clearly are implying that they reckon they will get it from the Karoo at some time, but that would again be post-2030. So a lot of the <coughs> difficult questions they've actually ducked by saying the plan will run to 2030, and you know after that we can make some of the, the, the tough decisions. And there was a little bit of a comment on the... Yeah, I agree CSP. entirely about the CSP. That's probably why it's that way, is because they didn't look at it um, on its full merits. Um, but you know, so, so there might be an excuse for it not being there, but it's totally at odds with what both ESCOM have said and, and Department of Trade and Industry have said previously about CSP being a technology that um, South Africa should be doing. Just, just, just before I take the next round, on the authorship, uh, Richard, you know, the 2010-1 IRP, some of the scenarios were run with the assistance of the Energy Intensive Users Group. Was the Intensive Energy Users Group involved in this one? Do you know? I know that, that Piet van Staden, who, who speaks for the Energy Intensive Users Group, was in the room with them when they were working on IRP because he's reflected that in conversation mm -hmm. but I don't know if they were officially there the modeling work is mostly been done by ESCOM and and that was previously the case too I mean ESCOM system operators have, have I don't know how much of that capacity is left people have observed that ESCOM's capacity in, in that regard has dwindled but you know they, they do have um, some good models there um, they're very different from the ESCOM generation and coal procurement folks. You know, they're totally different divisions. But um, so the the key stakeholders, as government likes to refer to them, are consulted along the way on what they're thinking about and what they're thinking of putting into the plan. But ostensibly, that's just in their in their capacity as another. <coughs> A bunch of experts, kind of like taking the, the cost assumptions from the Palo Alto Institute, the Electric Power Research Institute in California, which is where the technology cost assumptions originate. So they're, they're, they're not considered to be there as stakeholders, but simply to be providing their expertise. That's the theory. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, there was uh, Tembega and uh, Daniel, and uh, we need another and and that must come from 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 this side okay I, I, but no 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 i'm i'm just opening up you know the young people are working with it let's not hold this face so i'm giving it this side okay tell me yeah just on the point about the the absence of nuclear in the irp 2018 I think just reading between the lines of that plan and um, it reminds me 
of a presentation by my Peter and Climate Jobs um, Forum that um, often the debate around nuclear tends to undermine um, other sources of, um, of energy as potential alternatives. Um, in the sense that, you know, um, a renewable energy, that was his argument, um, might not be enough um, to, um, to, to um, what's the point? Um, yeah, to meet our energy demands. Uh, meaning that if we include renewable energy in the IRP 2018 going forward, etc., um, could also mean that exploring a gas as another form of, um, of alternative energy uh, in the sense that the renewable energy could uh, be done on, on the surface and underground um, gas um, could also be explored here uh, in, in, in South Africa. So I'm just checking with you, Richard, you know, um, those gray areas, I think they are in the IRP 2010, the absence of nuclear and what happens in between those years up until 2025, 26, 20, or over 2030? Are there any opportunities for, for gas exploration? I mean, yeah, if one reads between those lines in that IRP 2010. Okay. I'm a little curious about the significance of this particular, this particular form of solar energy in South Africa, because is there anything that makes this technology particularly interesting for South Africa? Because there have been a lot of underperforming plants in Spain, the United States, and question the value of PCS as a technology. Okay. Uh, I, 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 there's there's uh, comrade uh, Pram's hand, but he's had uh, he's a bit, so I'm not suppressing, but I would like other hands uh, before I give it to him. <laughs> I, I, I didn't introduce myself. I'm also a Sangoma. I read minds. So even if there's no hand, I can read the mind that there is a question there. Am I right? There's, there's no question. There's a comment, eh? That's just a comment. Ah, yeah. You see? The song of my knee works, eh? <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> okay. Oh, well. yeah. um, thank you very much, Richard, for the presentation. I think um, though there's a lot of graphs, I think you know our concern every time, but uh, it makes a lot of sense. And I like you, the fact. You hear the concern about the crafts, the community crafts. <laughs> no, he knows. That's our long story. Um, I think one thing, the way he simplified it, you know, starting from 2010 up until 2018, um, if this is the kind of information that could be shared widely with a lot of people so that people can make inputs into the draft. Um, I think concerning um, shale, shale gas fracking. There's, um, I think, in areas where there's um, uh, coal mines, we find that there's um, also mining for, for gas. I don't know what they call that type of gas. That happens around the Waterbeck area in Botswana and in other areas in South Africa where it is said that that kind of gas would be extracted. And I'm, I'm a little bit worried if um, that is going to be added because it's still like coal mining has got um, devastating impact on the environment. And on the nuclear issue, I think what we have now is a draft IRP. So whatever we have as draft on the IRP, we shouldn't be comfortable and say, this is how the final document is going to come out like. 
Um, we may find surprises like an addition of coal, an addition of um, a nuclear, and um, um, reduction on the renewable energy that uh, we long for because of the country's commitments. So my comment would be, let's not be comfortable with the draft as it is presented. Uh, we need to work around it to ensure that it becomes the kind of living document that we are comfortable with. All right. Uh, okay, I see the death. We shall just take the, those, those, those three, and then there's the death, and then from you to you idly. I can see you idly. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm going to, to draw a question from what McCullough said, even though I, I take it as, as a comment, but the, the issue of what happens post-2030 is something we really ought to be talking about now. We shouldn't be leaving it until that far in the future. So this ploy of, with this one, saying, well, this is our plan up to 2030, leaves a whole lot of issues that we're going to have to very much keep our eye open on. Whether we want to say at this stage, no, we don't want it to, settle with the plan for 2030, we want to look longer term, or we want to say, well, okay, we'll take this for 2030, but then can we get onto the plan for 2040 quick sticks and, and start dealing with those thornier issues? Because in the projections of the different scenarios, nuclear does appear post 2030 in some of those scenarios. So yes, thanks for the warning. Um, on the um, other kinds of gas that you get from coal, um, Underground coal gasification does seem to have gone off the agenda. I haven't heard much about it. They, they had a, a pilot plant at Majuba. It wasn't performing the way they wanted it to. They were talking about fracking the formations up in the Waterberg for, for underground coal gasification. Haven't heard about that. Again, it's not something to be complacent about, but it seems that, that is, at least for now, not one of the things they're pursuing. So on gas, the idea <coughs> is to say, well, we think we're going to have Kuru gas to build the gas infrastructure. And you know what that means, you build the gas infrastructure, then they're going to want to go for the Kuru gas, right? Because they've got just one. So it's a bit of one of these kind of chicken and egg arguments around gas at the moment. But I think the, the, the salient observation is South Africa to date does not have gas. And despite efforts searching, we don't have um, confirmed fields, although they might be a little off the West Coast. On um, the issue of um, Timbeke, if I don't get the whole question, you can tell me. But um, the thing about things uh, about whether one needs base load <coughs> or nuclear as base load, because renewables is variable, and being that renewables is variable, one needs dispatchable um, electricity supply to match it. So what that means is, wind follows the wind. It blows pretty much all the time around the country, but it goes up and down, and it's stronger in some places and time. So it's variable. Solar, of course, is variable in a more predictable way with the sun, it doesn't shine overnight. So even when you're getting most of your electricity from these variable resources, you do need dispatchable sources. And gas currently is the cheapest, particularly for peaking plant or what they call open cycle gas turbines. At the moment, we actually put diesel into our open cycle gas turbines because we've got that handy, bloody expensive, and ESCOM has been running up a hell of a bill again recently. But what you want is the dispatchable power. And so the link between dispatchable power and natural gas is not a necessary link. There's different ways of getting dispatchable power, the storage, including pump storage, and there's different ways of getting gas than natural gas from underground. In fact, we could synthesize gas in combination with um, electricity from renewables. So one of the technologies that is featured in that little black book is something that the CSIR is currently piloting which is to use renewable electricity through electrolysis to get hydrogen, and then using the technology that Sasol currently uses to turn coal to liquid fuel, you can take your hydrogen and waste CO2 and you can synthesize a gas. So you can have a syngas that operates these open cycle pika plants, which are known as open cycle gas turbines, but they can run off synthetic gas, not necessarily requiring natural gas. Um, so there really is um, a, a solid technical foundation for saying that we could provide all of our electricity from renewable resources once we built up the infrastructure to do so. Not tomorrow, but within a couple of decades. Um, 
Oh, and then, then just about the CSP. Um, I, I don't know what the, the performance of CSP has been like recently. I was really highlighting that to, to highlight the disjuncture between stated plans for industrial development, stated plans of what ESCOM is going to do, and then what we get in the plan over here. So for ages we were here, CSP is going to be a good thing for South Africa. We've already got we've got the, the right engineering capacity. ESCOM has been working on a plan for ages. ESCOM was hoping it could be a world leader in this technology. So we've gone from saying this will be a great thing to suddenly it's not, and no explanation as to why. But I, I can't attest to its performance, um, only that if it's going to perform well <coughs> anyway, South Africa would be, provides the right conditions for it. Last round, last round. <laughs> Beth? When the IFP was released, the new one, there were two groups of people whose voices I wanted to hear in response. The civil society and the nuclear lobby. Now, the nuclear lobby was for me the most interesting. They, they didn't only decry the fact that there are no plans to expand, but complain that the plan uh, puts the country on a path of things that are not there. Uh, inadequate supply. They, they, they argue that we don't have enough renewable energy resources. I, I, I thought that may be stupid, but uh, um, I don't think they're stupid enough to say it. So I'm hoping to get some verification. Do we have adequate renewable energy resources if we're calling for a shift to them? As they are questioning. Okay. Right? Is, is that a hand going up or oh, yeah. point of order? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it. Okay, right, yeah. And then I'll, I'll finish with the, if there's no other hand, you can have a very quick question yeah. about uh, demand. And uh, currently, you know, we're told that we have surplus of electricity, and I'm not sure what the demand calculation is, but I think it's important for us to question this notion of surplus and what level of demand because we sit in a situation of extreme energy poverty. So we should be providing poor people with lots more electricity than currently is happening. And I'm wondering uh, <coughs> how we can uh, enter the debate uh, on the issue of uh, demand. Okay, Comrade uh, Brown, finally. <laughs> Okay, thanks, thanks, Uber. Uh, just one thing uh, on what uh, Richard has touched on the country uh, the forecasting and also the modeling that we've done. I've noted in the report that the modeling is being done by a software. Uh, I think it comes from the CSIR, it's called Plexus. Plexus doesn't take into account the social economic impact of the introduction of this, this cost technology that we are planning to introduce. So it will be interesting that. As much as we are saying this is the future, we need to pick up and the stuff, do we realize what we are going to do to a, a, a mining communities? Now looking into the direct jobs, your indirect jobs, your induced jobs whereby the economic activity in those towns has been sustained for decades by the mining around there. You understand? Because it will be no use of us to say we've got this cheap technology is giving us uh, electricity at a cheaper price, but everyone else is not working. So it's saving, you understand? Now also, the second part I wanted to touch is the, the CSP that has been modeled here. This technology, when you check the ESCOM reports, they are paid 2.7 times during peak hour. So meaning that from half past four till half past nine, they are paid 2.7 times their normal tariff. And it can go six and five times the ESCOM normal time. So as much as we are saying we are introducing a new technology and stuff, do we take into account that the impact of the rising electricity tariffs on the economy on its own? Let alone the jobs now. 
that will be destroyed there. But do we take into consideration that in the economy, that there has been no growth from 2007 up to 2017? Absolutely no growth. That's why even Medrupi and Kusile is questionable to them when they are finished coming to commercial cooperation, the demand is not there. So we are not even touching the additional capacity from the renewables. There has been no growth at all. Thank you. All right. Richard. Okay, well, on the question, do we have enough renewable energy? Absolutely. And I'm kind of surprised too that, that someone from the nuclear industry would, would say something so patently false as that we don't have enough renewable energy. Um, maybe what they were meaning to say was that they don't believe we can do everything. I don't know. But the, our knowledge of our renewable resource base has improved phenomenally over the past 10 years. And this is not just the work of the CSIR. There's other work that's been done on it too. And it's because we've been looking at real meteorological data. So the modeling that's been done to establish how much is available is based on real time weather conditions over three years of weather conditions. So it's not just hypothetical, it's based on observation of what our weather is like. And from solar alone, we could get four times more electricity than we currently use and still not have used all the resources. Same thing with wind. The, there are things that constrain the shift to renewables. So there's issues on the timing, how long it takes to build the stuff and whether you want to retire what's there early or not. So the timing of it, nobody would suggest that we should do it overnight. Some people are suggesting we should give it 50 years. Some people are suggesting we can do it in two decades. That all depends on what you think about the challenges of localizing the manufacturing rather than just cheap buying the cheapest available internationally a mistake we made with solar water heaters when we said we were going to do solar water heating but we didn't have the localization plan for manufacturing in place and so loads and loads of cheap systems got brought in from china that didn't have to be the way it happened it was the way it, it was done um, and as a result we haven't seen a great social benefit from, so, from the introduction of solar water heat. Um, so the, the, the quality of the resource of solar and wind in South Africa are amongst the best in the world. The wind is not, as we used to think, just along the coast in the escarpment. It's pretty well spread across the country and CSIR has put out a lot of, of detailed maps showing what availability factor you can get from wind turbines across different parts of the countries. So the resource is still best, mostly along the coast, but there's also a bit up towards Zim, up by Messina. There's some serious wind up there. Um, one of the reasons we have a lot of wind is because we're at the end of a continent. So, you know, the geographical location of South Africa at the end of a continent, there's a lot of wind going around, but we're, we're exposed to wind. <coughs> Previously, it, installing the, the photovoltaic panels or the wind turbines, the cost was such that it was keeping renewables out. The question now really is what is a sensible pace for transitioning to renewables and how do we deal with the variable quality of the resource? So one way is just to build loads and loads and loads and loads of pump storage, but that's not a particularly benign technology. We wouldn't necessarily want to do that. So evolving a system where you do have peaker plants, which may be used natural gas for some time because it can be bought without a lot of infrastructure, but with a view to switching to syngas in future. I mean, at the moment, we run on diesel with a view to switch to gas. <coughs> Hasn't actually happened, but when they built the things, they said, well, we, we're building these things and we want to run them on gas. It's just that we'll run them on diesel until we've got the infrastructure to import the gas, which we still don't have. So there are various ways of dealing with the fact that, that, you're, de that you're depending primarily on, on a variable resource and different costs associated with them. But to say that we don't have enough renewables is just scientifically incorrect. Um, and the issue of surplus or enough demand, I'm not sure if that really was a question. I agree with you, it's, it's an issue that, that is not nicely dealt with and it's not dealt with in the IRP, but they don't really talk about um, surplus in the IRP, that ESCOM has talked about it, but 
in the IRP itself, it's just about saying that our, our projections of demand in the past were wrong, and we think we're getting it better this time, although they don't manage to instill a lot of confidence in the stakeholders I've spoken to about them getting it right this time. And they haven't looked at the shifting roles of different energy carriers within the energy system as a whole. So on the one hand, you could argue that they're still assuming exponential um, economic growth and electricity demand on the base of that, which is, is rather speculative. On the other hand, you could say, well, maybe that's not such a bad thing because actually we should be doing more and more things with electricity rather than with coal or liquid fuels from oil. And so, you know, if they overestimate demand a little bit, well, it gives us some wiggle room to be doing more um, electrification of things that currently use different energy carriers. So not to disagree with you about the surplus issue, but I think we need to keep it separate a bit from the demand projections, which are problematic for a number of reasons, um, and none of which provides an excuse for not making energy services available to everybody when, when we know we've got more than enough. Um, just one other point on renewables, um, even the, the energy intensive users group are now advocating for renewables because it is the least cost option. So they do a lot of number crunching on macroeconomic analysis and it's their view that the downstream impacts, previously they used to argue we must stick with coal because it gives it's the cheapest option for electricity if you ignore the externalized costs, climate change, et cetera. We must do that because downstream will create jobs by having cheap energy, cheap electricity in particular. The EIUG still argues that we must have cheap electricity for growth and for jobs. But they're saying that because of the way the technology costs have changed, they're now advocating for a mix which uses as much renewables as possible and then tops up with dispatchable supply around it because their argument is that'll give us more jobs down the street. That's Peter Sardin of Sasser. And, 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 uh, Richard, uh, you, you wanted to, about the uh, socioeconomic economic uh, factors that are ignored in the, in the assumption? Mm -hmm. Well, that, um, IRP does not do um, big socioeconomic impact assessment. They get the plan, Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation to take a look. Um, and a bunch of other uh, institutions do do that kind of modeling. So you, it, this plan will be subject to that kind of modeling mm -hmm. over coming weeks as the Energy Research Center plugs the plan into their models to see what the impacts will be. Um, but the IRP itself is is not tasked with doing, and in fact, it's it's very very quiet even on jobs, even though they've got assumptions and they've they've got everything they need <coughs> to do modelling of jobs, but they've decided not to go there, and they don't say why they've decided not to go there. Um, so it just leaves us to speculate. The CSIR runs a Plexos model, kind of a. It's kind of a shadow model of the DOE model. They try and make it populated with all exactly the same assumptions as, as DOE uses. And they've done job um, job uh, numbers analysis. And I've got a whole lot of information on that, but we don't have time to get into it now. But if you're interested in seeing some of that, um, but yeah, I'm not aware of the DOE extending their work to, to include what CSIR has already um, shown them what they could be doing. All right, my contract is uh, is up. Let's give a hand to Richard and everyone. Thank you very much. I'm not going to try. I mean, I think it's been a long and intense day, so I'm not going to try and kind of summarise and highlight the key issues. I think we have been doing that as we go along. Perhaps we can actually start with that tomorrow morning, rather, and just remind ourselves that these are the key issues that came up came up today. Um, we're going to start at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning with an input from Salim <coughs> on Eskom and the current of crisis in Eskom, et cetera. Um, so please, if, if comrades can be here, quarter to nine, so you can have some coffee, a biscuit, and then come in. Um, so we'll have some we'll have some discussion on Eskom, then we're going to look at the manufacturing sector, and then we're going to broaden it out to a bit of a an overview, a kind of a bird's eye view of what you know what are what are the different components um, of the, of the electricity sector. So comrades, it's going to be another full day tomorrow. 
Um, so, yeah, sleep well, rest well, see you all. Quarter to nine for a cup of coffee tomorrow morning. Thanks. Orti. Um,